Okay, very good evening. I'm here to discuss about the NEET PG 2023 uh, OBG questions. So since this is a recall session, so we are not going to get the exact options and questions. Whatever the uh, students have given me the feedback based on that, this is uh, based on that I've seen the questions. And uh, what is good about this time exam was it's a very conceptual based questions were asked. If you know the topic, it was very simpler. That means you can rule out other options. So uh, there were some uh, one or two controversial questions, not like previous years. There are there were a lot of controversial questions. Um, and whatever we have discussed in the revision uh, uh, sessions have come. A lot of questions had I have seen. I hope uh, most of you would have answered it right. And this session is not to see whether you're given a right option or not. This is only for the benefit of the uh, students who are uh, going to take up the future exam, okay? And for the other exam, okay, we'll, uh, without wasting our time, we'll start with the session. It will. I started with a very simple question, parity index of the women who had a twin delivery. I really don't know the exact uh, question that has been framed, but there is a the quest. The question was on the parity with of a woman who had a twin delivery. So this is the screenshot that is directly from the workbook. So here, um, so when I say parity, what do you mean by parity? Is the number of pregnancy that have crossed more than twenty weeks, respective of their outcome, and present pregnancy is not included. That is very important. So present pregnancy was not included. So, um, so what is the parity here? When you're talking about the parity, parity is going to be para 1. Okay, so parity is P1 is going to be the parity. Talking about the gravida, she's going to see it's a second pregnancy. So she's G2, P1. What do you mean by gravida? It's a number of times the woman has conceived including the present pregnancy that is going to be defined as gravidum. So gravida para is a very basic thing. So they asked a question from that. It's really good. And what you have to know, twin pregnancy is taken as a single pregnancy and the period of viability at 20 weeks uh, is at 20 weeks. It's considered as 20 weeks. In India, it is 28 weeks. This is according to WHO. And what are the other things can be expected from this? What are the obstetric scoring system? Which is a very basic. This can also be a future question. So it is gravida with P. That is X and P. That is number of uh, times she has conceived. And A, A is generally representing. That is the number of uh, number of pregnancies. Uh, irrespective of the outcome in the present pregnancy. The another way of writing is GX P A plus B. That is A is number of living and B is number of abortions. Okay. The third system is called the GT PAL system formula or the system where you will write the gravida and the T PAL. T is for the term, P for preterm, A for abortion. And A L for living. This is the latest method. It's important that you should also know this uh, part of your scoring system, which is a very basic. Now coming to the next question. Yes, this is again um, what to say if it's it's a very easy question. It's uh, a simple uh, way to understand. If you should have read the question properly, you'll you would have easily reached your answer. She is a multi gravida. Okay, she is gravida to para 1 with the previous normal delivery. She is a normal delivery with 36 plus six, uh, 6 weeks with confirmed transverse line. Uh, and the weight of the baby, I think they have given as 2.8 kg on ultrasound. That's what uh, I got it from the students. Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know. What is the next best step? So the answer here it is ECV. It directly fits under the criteria for ECV. Of course, you can do an LSES, but why do you? Were you? Uh, she is a normal previous normal delivery. She can. She will definitely prefer to go for a again a vaginal delivery, and uh, she fulfills all the criteria for ECV. So this is again uh, this is what we had discussed in the um, 
revision uh, revision session for the external cephalic version. So, what are the indications? Breach presentation, transverse lie, oblique lie, and uh, prerequisites more than thirty six weeks. That's what is a prerequisite they have given there. Prerequisite is a singleton pregnancy, healthy mother and baby, like adequate with the membranes present, and there should be a facility for emergency LSES. And what are the contraindications? Can be a future questions. Contraindications, complications. Yes, ECV is per se is a very, very, very important topic. They, there can be a lot of questions, and this was an easier question from ECV. And we'll see the next question. What was the next question? Yes. This too was a very, um, we have discussed in our revision series, what is the treatment for the cervical cancer? See, the question um, uh, from the uh, recall, I got the question as a cervic a women with a cervical cancer involving the parametrium. Parametrium extending to the lateral pelvic wall. I'm not sure of the lateral pelvic wall, but the parametrium is there. So, any see, when you say parametrium, it is reached 2B, right? So, it's going to be 2B. Anything after 2B, okay, even if it's extending, it's going to be 3B, right? So, it's parametrium, it's come up to 3B now. What is the management? The answer is a very direct question. It's a chemo radiation. I think from the cervical cancer management, this was like really um, relatively very easy question because it's a straightforward question. As we have discussed in a revision session, these are the surgeries. So, this, uh, this one I have discussed about the surgeries here. And what we have seen was a chemo radiation is a treatment of choice for stage 2B and beyond. And if the lesion is more than or equal to 4 centimeter. So this was um, relatively a easier uh, question that they have framed from the management part of cervical cancer. So uh, the answer is chemo radiation was a direct question. Next question. Yes. There was a lot of confusion for this question. Yes. Um, seven weeks pregnancy. She uh, she is with a hemoglobin of nine gram. Um, what is the time taken for the uh, appropriate time for the iron supplementation? See, I don't know whether they've asked what is the appropriate time for iron supplementation. But of course, I think uh, there might, uh, I don't know the exact question. But it was a seven week with a hemoglobin of nine. So, when can we start her with the uh, iron supplementation? So, the answer here is, remember, uh, many of them will give an answer as after 14. See, remember, after 14 weeks is what we are giving is a prophylactic. She is already anemic now. Yes, right. She is already anemic. How much is her hemoglobin? Hb is 9. So, she is already under moderate anemia. She is already anemic. So, it's better to start her on iron it's now the next point comes is what iron can be started which is iron oral iron or parenteral iron remember in the first trimester parenteral iron is contraindicated and we don't start her on uh, parenteral iron so we start giving her with the oral iron what is the problem with oral iron it causes a lot of gastritis already she'll be with vomiting so all this will increase the risk uh, of uh, increases the chances of gastritis so what happens? So what is advice you can give? Uh, consume the uh, iron tablets with the meals. That can be one advice that can be given. So the answer here is seven weeks. Uh, it's already she have anemic. She is already anemic. So the treatment to be given should uh, should be uh, iron, oral iron, and. Uh, that to be the answer, uh, I don't know the fourth option, the, whatever option given, it should be 8 to 10 weeks. Okay, coming to the next question. Uh, from the labor question, uh, they've asked this partograph, yes. Partograph and the recent one is WHO care, labor care guide should be known. It's a very important topic from the labor question. Yes, of course, they've asked questions from partograph. So, what does the question say? Uh, the patient um, photograph showed it has crossed the action line. It's a fully dilated with meconium. 
that means the membranes are ruptured and it's a fully dilated and molding is 2 plus. Fetal heart rate is decreasing with the station high up. When I say 3 plus, it's a higher station. Okay, oxytocin was given. I think the options was instrumental delivery, uh, emergency cesarean section, or you wait and watch. I think wait for the descent. I think what I don't know about the fourth option. Okay, so uh, see when I say three plus, definitely you're not gonna put an instrument. So that's rule out. Instrument is not there with a norm. With this one thing, you can rule out. And see what is this fully dilated with meconium and has already crossed the action line. It has crossed the action line. That means you have to act now. Okay, that's what it means. You cross the action line. You have to intervene. Molding is two plus. And there is fetal heart rate is decreasing. And oxytocin is already given. So option here, the diagnosis here is the secondary arrest of descent. Okay. I don't know whether she's a primary, multi, all that, uh, all the stuff. So I don't know. But yes, the answer here will be emergency. LSCS already. It is meconium. And the station is high up. And there is also heart rate decreasing. And the action line has been crossed in a partograph, all indicating for emergency LSES. So, this is a very um, uh, easier question. So, to have got the catch of station 3 plus, instrument delivery is gone. Fetal heart rate is decreasing and she's developing molding with the uh, action line crossing. All that will say you can never wait for the descent. You can't sit and wait. Okay. So, the answer here will be emergency LSES. Okay. Next question. This also had little controversies. Many go with, uh, went with the answer of transvaginal septum. We'll see what is the question first. See, a 16-year-old present with a primary amenorrhea with cyclical pain and a suprapubic bulge. Uh, swelling felt on the entire length of the vagina on per rectal examination. What is your diagnosis? Yes, the answer here is imperfect hymen. This question has also been discussed a lot many times in our revision session also we have discussed. Mm, see, here uh, they've asked primary amenorrhea per se is a very, very, very important topic. They can ask you n number of questions, but this time you had two questions from primary amenorrhea itself. And um, uh, the answer, one small catch in the question was, Swelling felt on the entire length of the vagina. This might be little uh, for you to confuse. So that's why uh, they would have given this, not giving the typical uh, history of imperforate hymen. So we'll be discussing it. So the answer here is imperforate hymen. In transverse vaginal septum, the swelling will be felt in the upper one third of the vagina. Upper one third aspect of the vagina. And cervical agenesis, vaginal agenesis, see, this is already ruled out. It's a typical uh, history. Okay. So, this is uh, also a screenshot from um, the revision series. Okay. So, imperfect hymen is they usually present with primary amenorrhea with normal sexual characteristics, cyclical abdominal pain that with. Hematocolpus, hematometra, or hematosalpin. So on examination, bulging bluish hymenal membrane or the blind ending pouch on examination. So this typical history they have not given. Yes, of course. Uh, but it's a very easier question. Uh, if you would have known the catch, it's easier. Diagnosis is by clinical or ultrasound or MRI. Rarely it is associated with. Uh, urological abnormalities and treatment here is you give us a cruciate incision, uh, sterile puncture, single dose of prophylactic antibiotic, and estrogen cream is applied for the hymenal ring re epithelialization. So, this is about the uh, imperforate hymen. Next question yes, ectopic is very important topic. As this question has been discussed a number of times. Uh, this question, I think it was discussed in a little different way. But yeah, management also we have discussed. Uh, primary gravida with delayed periods. Uh, they had not given exact period of gestation. The patient presented with spotting PV and lower abdominal pain. An ultrasound, 
uh, it was 2.5 into 3.5 centimeter tubal ectopic pregnancy with no cardiac activity. Beta HCG was 2800. So, what is the best management? What is the answer? Answer is here it is single dose uh, methotrexate is the answer. Okay. There can be two uh, problems between the two. Either it's a single dose methotrexate, multi dose will be coming to it. The single dose is the most uh, effective compared to the multi dose uh, methotrexate. Oral methotrexate we don't use in ectopic pregnancy. Okay. Self injectomy, she is not having all the features are suggestive of a unruptured ectopic pregnancy. So, self injectomy is also again it's ruled out. Talking about the single dose methotrexate or a multiple dose, yes, there might be confusion between the two. But yeah, we have discussed even this in our uh, class. See, uh, in a class, what we have discussed for the medical management, all the criteria, it fits under your medical management. What are the criteria? She is hemodynamically stable. Serum beta HCG is less than five um, international units. And tubal acropic pregnancy is less than 3.5 centimeter with viable cardiac activity. Without it is less than or equal to 4 centimeter without cardiac activity. No contraindication for the usage of the drug mild or the absent pain that's what uh, is the criteria for the medical management talking about whether the drugs that used for medical management the most commonly used is methotrexate it's also important for us to know what are the other drugs used uh, sorry for the color i will just read out it's methotrexate prostaglandins uh, kcl it is potassium iodide hyperosmolar glucose actin mycin d Mifepristone and vasopressin, these are the drugs used for the medical management. And yes, this has come as a question. A single dose methotrexate is more effective and less toxic as compared to multiple dose regimen. So that is what will be the answer. Now you will get your answer. The single dose methotrexate will be the most apt answer for this question. Yes, of course, multiple dose can be given but which is most commonly used which is more effective and less toxic well, so the answer will be single dose methotrexate this is uh or this is also a chart that we have simplified for the single dose multiple dose and uh, two dose regimen all the doses also we have discussed in a revision session um this is about ectopic pregnancy yes ectopic pregnancy topic is going to be a very very important don't uh, for to miss uh, marks from these topics uh, ectopic pph are very very important topics definitely they'll be repeatedly asking questions from that this question um, i think this question we have discussed in a slightly different way in our revision session a girl presented to opd with the primary amenorrhea so she's primary amenorrhea with no secondary sexual characteristics. Okay. So it is primary amenorrhea with no secondary sexual characteristics. Okay. And there is absent ovaries. So and there is no uterus, fallopian tubes, and ovaries. Everything is absent. Bilateral inguinal masses are present and she is no, she is of normal height. She is of normal height. Yeah. Okay. What is their diagnosis? Yes. This even if you don't know, we have discussed a chart in our session, revision session. Yes, this was a chart. Approach to case scenarios. So in this, um, I think with this chart, you could have ruled out most of the things there. So the option that was given, we'll be discussing the options. The complete AIS, they present with primary amenorrhea, breast development, tanner 4 to 5. That means there is a well-developed breast, no pubic head development, bilateral inguinal hernia on examination. So that will be for complete for uh, uh, androgen insensitivity syndrome. Talking about incomplete, it's same, but in addition, there is presence of clitoromegaly in case of incomplete um, androgen insensitivity syndrome. And the, what was another option that was given was Turner syndrome. 
the turner syndrome they present with pulmonary amenorrhea with no or less developed secondary sexual characteristics but remember the uterus ovaries fallopian tubes are developed but they are infantile that is what is important in turner syndrome and another important is short stature ovaries the hallmark typical word that you used to describe is peak ovaries in turner's syndrome the counterpart of this turner syndrome is sievers syndrome primary amenorrhea with no secondary sexual characteristics but they have a normal stature that is about the sievers uh, sievers syndrome okay now coming back to our question <coughs> even if you don't know the option you would have ruled out this is like more of a elimination type of question okay complete ais is ruled out why <coughs> breast development is absent no breast development so this is ruled out turner syndrome normal height this is about um, another option is pcos pcos they don't present with primary amenorrhea they present with secondary amenorrhea so you see there was lot of um, uh problem with many uh, students had problem with this question but yeah if you would have applied the rule of how to approach questions i have uh, what we have discussed the table this will be really easier so it's a rule of elimination elimination that uh, you could have answered this question even if you didn't know this you could have eliminated each uh, topic i mean each options and the answer will be c okay see i'm not very pretty sure about the uh, options i think um, uh, if uh, there will be um, i'm not very sure it's hypogonadotropic hypogonadism was another option but whatever options i got it the option will be c okay next question see it's a very uh, straight forward question from the history itself you can know there was again a very simple clue that had been given in your question so with that you could have answered it easily one is a primary gravida at 28 weeks with the fetal parts not easily palpable with she presented with maternal res, res, uh, respiratory distress the fundal height is 41 cm that is more than that of her period of gestation abdomen is tense but it is non tender so that will rule out your abruption fhr is not easily heard fetal movements are normal that means baby is moving all that is pointing towards that it's not an abruption okay another one is what is the diagnosis polyhydromnias is the answer hydatiform mole is not the option to in pregnancy no abruption is also ruled out it's a very uh, straightforward question so the answer here is polyhydromnias yes uh, there was another question on uh, supine hypotension syndrome um i really didn't get what type of uh, <clears throat> question that was options i just know that there was a question from uh, supine hypotension syndrome um next is about uh, contraindications in patient with pph and history behind bronchial asthma with the history of bronchial asthma see this one also we have recently discussed in a revision session so what is the drugs uh, that is used in pph and uh, of course the answer is very straightforward the answer is carboprostol it is pgf2 alpha it's also called hebamate any of this options would have been there that is the uh, carboprostol we have discussed in a revision session so this is again our um, revision uh, revision session uh, uh, screenshot 
So the we have discussed both the mesoprostol as well as a carbamate or uh, carboprost is also called habamate, which is given in the dose of uh, 0 0.25 milligram given IV IM every 15 to 90 minutes interval. Maximum doses up to eight doses. Maximum dose that you can give is two grams. Side effects are diarrhea, hypertension, vomiting, fever, flushing, tachycardia, and chills. Yes, we have discussed what is this. this contraindication is asthma, suspected amniotic fluid embolism, and related contraindication is renal, liver, and cardiac diseases. Yes, there was a lot of lot of controversies again around this question. A patient she presented with <clears throat> the catch here was she presented with a cervical erosion. That means she is having a cervical lesion with a vaginal discharge <coughs> and dysuria. And her husband is a truck driver. Okay. What is the most appropriate kit? Most of them have answered it as green, thinking it's a vaginal discharge. See, the question here was to, whole point is to describe here was, there was an erosion, okay, the lesion in the cervix. <coughs> So they're telling most likely that was a cervical discharge rather than a vaginal discharge. That's what indirectly they meant to say. There was a cervical erosion <coughs> and vaginal discharge and dysuria. Husband is a truck driver. Okay. So the answer here was great. So we'll be following the uh, syndromic um, approach. That's what is by the NACCO. See, gray is for, for the, see, many per questions, what they've asked is, students they're asking is, uh, the gray is for the urethral symptoms, cervical discharge, and the pain scrotal swelling. Yes, but they have given the uh, question as a cervical lesion. This is to indicate, indirectly to say that the lesion is uh, leading to the discharge. So, it is also meaning that it is cervical discharge presenting as vaginal discharge. Okay. So, the, uh, that's what is the main uh, <coughs> confusion here. So, uh, they, they have not given a cervical lesion or uh, erosion. You would have directly jumped to vaginal discharge and the answer will be green kit. But here, the, uh, the question is with the cervical erosion with a cervical, with a vaginal discharge. So, you have to concentrate on the lesion. So, the answer here is a gray kit which has the azithromycin and the cefixime. Um, this is by the NACO and it's a very um, usual uh, easy question syndromic approach <clears throat> yes, this is more of a memory question but um, yes there was a little catch was giving that the cervical erosion that was a small catch in the question people would have understood that it's it was little easier <clears throat> okay Next question is, um, a 23-year-old female married for six months and cohabiting with her husband and not able to conceive. What is the next step in the management? Do a semen analysis, um, HSD, reassure and follow up after six months. I don't know the fourth option. Okay. But remember, she will not fit under infertility first. It, is not, it should be more than one year, right? More than equal to one year. Only then you can label her as infertility. And she's, remember, she's young age, only six months cohabiting with her husband and not able to conceive what is the next step in the management. The answer is reassure and ask her to follow up after six months. Remember, we will also know, if she's not fitting under the definition of infertility, definitely we're not going to do her, uh, give her any uh, advice in the, investigations uh, for her or not for her husband. So the answer will be just sure, reassure the patient and ask her to follow up after six months. From infertility, I think this is a very easy question, not uh, complicating things. It's a very easier question. If you know the definition of infertility, the answer will be easier for you. A woman with a history of cancer cervix and a daughter is 14 year old. <coughs> Cancer cervix does not have a genetic component. 
So here it's a simple answer will be HPV. So this is going to be the answer. All this is not done. They are not very sure of certain options, especially cervical biopsy and those things. I think there was uh, one more option I got was HPV testing. I don't know what are the other options. Uh, the, but the answer is HPV vaccine is the answer for this question. Hysteroscopy also we have revised in our uh, class. The very simple one. Hysteroscopy is a, a instrument that is used to go into the uterine cavity with that small um, background. At least you could have answered this. Cervical polyp without even a, it's going to be seen outside. Why do you need a hysteroscope for that? So this option is ruled out. Subserious meiosis, subserious, so this is the uterus. Subserious, the fibroid is going to be outside. Definitely putting a hysteroscope inside is not going to be helpful. Ruled out. Tubal ligation, tubes are outside. You're not going to ligate. You can do only a laparoscopic hysteroscopy. Tubal ligation is not used. Asherman syndrome, this is the investigation of choice as well as for the treatment. Yes, both we have discussed in our revision session. So, uh, we have also discussed what are the distension media. Yes, they've asked a question from... Uh, about uh, the um, distension media and the hysteroscopy, we'll be dealing with later. Um, so, yes, we have discussed this question on hysteroscopy, the indication. So, um, what they have asked was the Asherman syndrome. Asherman syndrome also we have discussed. Asherman syndrome is due to intrauterine sinica formation that is secondary to the vigorous uterine curettage in the postpartum period. The, so, in the hysteroscopy is going to be the investigation of choice. What is the appearance in HSG is a honeycomb appearance. As well as a treatment that you do with a hysteroscopic lysis is done again with a hysteroscopically. It's both the investigation of choice as well as used for the treatment of Asherman syndrome. Again, if this is also a question of elimination, if you would have eliminated that option, you would have reached your answer. So again, I your question. <clears throat> yes. This question created a lot of confusions among students. See, too little the patient and the most compl complication that you encounter in hysteroscopy. Too little deficient is about the surgeon. It's not for the patient. That's the whole point. If you have uh, understood that. Nothing. See, hysteroscopy, you're using a distension media, distending fluid. Okay. Two liter fluid is deficient for the surgeon. That means there is excess in case of a patient. So the most common complication that we encounter is the pulmonary edema. It's a very simple logic. But the, the way they frame the question was a little complicated. Um, see, when I talk about neat uh, questions, overall questions were okay. But the the way they framed was little uh, creating a confusion. That otherwise, it's the same topics that has been repeated. Hysteroscopy is a very important uh, um, aspect from the gynae, so um, it should be read in and out. Too little deficient is for the surgeon and not for the patient. If that you would have understood from your question. This is also an easy uh, question. Next question is in obese women with a history of acne and not responding to antibiotic and isotretinoin. So this is not an antibiotic resistance. Okay, this is not history is not suggestive of an antibiotic resistance. Testing for a trigger factor. This is also not an option. Testing for insulin resistance. No. <clears throat> this is a testing for the hyperandrogenism where there is increase in the testosterone levels that is leading to all these problems. That is not responding to antibiotic and isotretinoin. So it is tested for hyperandrogenism is the option for this. Yes. Uh, as we had a very good uh, VSV classes, image-based questions we have discussed and the same image has come. 
so the patient, the history was the patient was on injection HMT. Yes, that's what we have discussed. In our class, we have discussed that the patient uh, OHSS, this is the case of OHS, ovarian hyperstimulative syndrome. It's a hydrogenic condition is because of the increase in the gonadotrophins. It is increases with the HMG compared to that of the clomiphene citrate or the letrozole when used for ovulation um, induction. Okay. So uh, other factors we have discussed in our class where that is main causes because of the increase in the production of VEGF that is from the ovarian stroma leading to a series of symptoms that you see in OHSs with ascites edema okay so this as um i think from image wise questions i was so happy seeing this question that we have discussed uh, and i think most of you would have answered this question i have no doubt about it and uh, um, i think definitely the option also uh, had the pcos but i'm sure you would have differentiated the both and um, and you would have written the answer because we have discussed only in such a format that how to differentiate between P2S and uh, OHSS and the history was very suggestive of OHSS. I think uh, most of you uh, would have definitely got this question right. Another question was on Bartholin cyst. I'm not sure about what image. Uh, this is just a, a reference image. I uh, that the uh, in, in image based questions was direct from a Bartholin abscess. It's a very simple question. Okay, there's nothing to discuss on that. Yes, there was a question uh, where we had a last high yielding session, revision sessions. We have seen the infections. I think there were some three questions from infections. I think CMV, there were two questions. Aula appearance, again, it's in CMV. That's a direct question. Intraventricular calcification that we have discussed. CMV, periventricular. Calcification was a question that has been asked. I think I don't know whether it's a made by questions or they were asked about a periventricular calcification that you commonly count, encounter in a uh, uh, cytomegalovirus infection. Okay. <coughs> we also discussed that parenchymal or the intravent, uh, intracranial to say generalized calcification. It's a feature of a toxoplasmosis that also we have discussed. The two differences we have discussed between both. And another question, I think, that was on um, rubella. That was a PDA. I told that uh, there was a three things that you have to remember rubella. Again, that was asked as a question. Deafness, PDA, where you can see a cardiac defect, especially the septal. Another one is thrombocytopenia, purpura, and diabetes. So even if you could have forgotten everything, I think this is also we have discussed, re revised it properly. I think most of you should have got it right. But rubella, I think something to do with PDA only they have asked. Cardiac defect, again, I'm not sure of what type of question was asked. But there was a question from rubella asking uh, related to a cardiac defect that you see in, uh, see in rubella. Uh, that's all. Uh, that's all for the session. These are the questions I had got. I think I've uh, discussed everything. Um, keep uh, see. Once you have completed your exam, don't think much about it. You're given your hundred percent. Hope for the best, and um, hope. Uh, I have discussed almost most things. Many would have be, uh, many questions were also we have discussed in our revision session. I think uh, most questions were a uh, kind of uh, question framing was a difficult part. That was a, a, a problem here. The question kind of frame, I don't know whether because recall many could have uh, many uh, were. Uh, Controversy saying this and that. I'm not very sure of the options also. But whatever I've got it, I've discussed. It's not exactly. This is only a recall. Okay. So I might be wrong with some options. Um, I think um, we've discussed everything. Okay. That's it. Thank you.